Okay, so welcome to the beginner astronomy class. I'm going to do a somewhat short presentation on exoplanets. Um, I'm not going to go into great technical detail. I just mostly want to expose folks to what they are, a little bit about how they were discovered, and um, things that are related to that. So let's go ahead and get going here. All right, everybody knows what this is. This is our solar system. It's just a simple diagram, of course not drawn to scale, but you can tell that uh, you know we've got a sun in the middle, planets and things that orbit around it. But what about things that are outside of this? What about things that are not stars, they're not nebula, not deep space objects that are outside of our solar system? And uh, we're gonna talk about exoplanets. Exoplanets are also called extrasolar because they're outside our solar system. Um, as of January the 29th of 2013, as in just a few days ago, 863 exoplanets in 678 planetary systems, which include 129 multiple planetary systems, have been identified. So we've got quite a lot of these that we now have confirmed that exist. The Kepler mission, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, has detected over 18,000 more exoplanet candidates, including 262 that are potentially habitable. We don't necessarily mean by humans, but any kind of life whatsoever. In the Milky Way galaxy, it's expected that there are many billions of planets, at least one per star. So if you look at this picture right here, each of those have an estimated at least one or more planets around them. That means that there is as many as 100 to 400 billion exoplanets, not only occurring around stars, but also as free-floating planetary mass bodies. And we're talking about planetary bodies that are just flying through space, not around any star. In the center of the image, you're going to see that there's two bright objects that are visible. On the right is going to be Jupiter, and on the left is Antares. And what, what you're seeing in this picture here is actually a very significant um, telescope array that's used for finding exoplanets. And uh, this is the very large telescope in Chile. Um, the one on the right there is one of four that they use in conjunction with each other to, to uh, explore the heavens. That laser that you see in that picture is actually pointing direct, directly at the galactic center. So this is the center of the Milky Way galaxy that the rest of our galaxy orbits around. Okay, so this is an artist's concept of what the galaxy should look like as far as um, stars with planets around them. Now this isn't drawn to scale. Um, the planets are too big, their, orbi their orbits are too small, but uh, the artist just kind of wants to give people an idea of this being kind of the norm, that as we look out there and we see all these stars, that there are probably at least one planet or more around each of them. Uh, a six-year search that surveyed millions of stars using the microlensing technique, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, concluded that planets around stars are the rule rather than the exception. Oh, are she locked out? Go ahead, thanks. Okay, okay there we go. So the average number of planets per star is greater than one. So it's actually more common that a star would have a planet around it than not have a planet around it. Okay, this is the nearest known exoplanet, and th the planet is there on the right. It's called Alpha Centauri BB. Almost all the planets detected so far are within the Milky Way galaxy. Um, but there have been a small number of extragalactic planets that they think they may have found. I don't think any of them are confirmed, but that means planets that are actually not in our galaxy, but are in other galaxies, which is really exciting. Um, astronomers at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, or CFA, reported in January 2013, just this past month, that at least 17 billion Earth-sized exoplanets are estimated to reside in the Milky Way galaxy. So most of what they find are these really huge big planets, uh, but they, they, have now, they have now estimated that about 17 billion planets in our galaxy are about the size of the Earth, which is very exciting. This is just an artist's impression of the, um, the planet orbiting Alpha Centauri b. Um, this particular star system has three in it. There's Alpha Centauri a, Alpha Centauri b, and Alpha Centauri c. And then uh, because of the way that they name exoplanets related to their, their parent star, then Alpha Centauri b, lowercase b, is the first planet that uh, they found that orbits around that. Okay, and it says uh, in my notes here that a tiny signal of the planet was found with the HARPS spectrograph on a 3.6 meter telescope at ESO's La Silla Observatory in Chile. 
the the um, big telescopes that I showed earlier are, are there, and uh, most likely they're talking about um, the telescopes in that area. When they say 3.6 meter telescope, they mean that the width of that telescope is 3.6 meters wide. That's that's incredible. Okay, so for centuries, lots of philosophers figured that extra planets existed, but they didn't have any way of finding them. They had no idea how common they were or how similar they might be to our own solar system. There were a lot of different claims in the 19th century. Um, various people, you can go out there and Google it, a lot of folks um, claimed that they had found planets, but every single one of those uh, was uh, found to be untrue, and they were rejected by all astronomers. The first confirmed detection, and this is important, the first confirmed detection came in 1992 with the discovery of several terrestrial mass planets orbiting the pulsar, this is hard, <laughs> PSR B1257 plus 12. Now say that 10 times fast. Um, this is an <laughs> artist's impression of the extrasolar planets that are orbiting this pulsar. And I kind of like this because, um, you know, you, that thing you see in the lower right there is kind of like uh, akin to the aurora borealis that we see here on Earth. But uh, I don't believe that uh, they think that there are any, that there would be life on anything like um, a planet going around a pulsar because of the, the violent nature of that system. Okay. Now, that was the first confirmed planet around a pulsar. The first confirmed detection of an exoplanet orbiting a main sequence star was made in 1995. So we're not talking about hundreds of years ago or even dozens of years ago. We're talking just a, a, just a few years ago in 1995. A giant planet was found on a four-day orbit around the nearby star 51 Pegasi. Because of improved op observational techniques, the rate of detection has increased rapidly since then. And again, this is an artist's concept of 51 Pegasi an orbiting planet, 51 Pegasi B. And so, um, you know, you, you go back here and you look and you say, wow, I mean, we really haven't been, we only found the first one in 1992. So this is a relatively new phenomenon in astronomy. This isn't something that I personally grew up hearing about and uh, really didn't start hearing a lot about it until recent years. All right. Most known exoplanets are giant planets believed to resemble Jupiter and Neptune. Um, just like you see here on the screen. And this isn't because the uh, universe is dominated by these, it's because they're easy to find. Um, there's a, the reason that so many of them that have been found are giant planets are because of a sampling bias. Uh, massive planets are more easily observed, and some are relatively lightweight exoplanets, only a few times more massive than Earth, now known by the term super-Earth. Have any of you heard of this super-Earth thing in the news? or? seen anybody post anything about it on Facebook? Um, statistical studies now indicate that they actually outnumber giant planets, while recent discoveries have included Earth-sized and smaller planets, and a handful that appear to exhibit other Earth-like properties. So it seemed in the beginning that these giant planets were more common, but it, it, it was only because they're easier to detect, which simply because of their size. Okay, this is, this is one of the things that I find really fascinating, and I only learned about these just a few months ago, and I mentioned it earlier. There are also these planetary mass objects that orbit brown dwarfs and other bodies that float free in space, so they're not bound to any star. They're just floating through space. Um, they've been called rogue planets, interstellar planets, nomad planets, free-floating planets, and orphan planets. Um, these are huge, massive rocky or gaseous objects that have either been ejected from their system or they were never gravitationally bound to any star in the first place. Um, so uh, they do believe, I read an article, I guess it was uh, last November, about a, um, a, a body like this that they theorized had been whipped out of its orbit by a gravitational pull of another planet and was actually ejected from its solar system. How so did they detect these things? Um, we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. These particular ones, I would guess, are really hard to detect, and I would think they would have to be very close by, because most of the detection methods involve somehow or some way that they interact with the star that they orbit around. So that's a very good question, and I don't have a clear answer for you. So uh, I may, as we get further into our notes, I may have a couple of things to say about it, but I don't, I don't have any specific information about that one. So. 
The discovery of extrasolar planets, particularly those that orbit in the habitable zone, that's a zone around a star where water is likely to exist. It's neither too cold nor too hot, uh, liquid water to exist, um, and therefore life. Um, they think that without liquid water, it'd be very difficult for life to exist. So scientists, uh, when they're looking for extraterrestrial life, they focus on areas of solar systems where they believe that at least there could be liquid water. Um, that has, that look and then that search for liquid water has really intensified the search for these, um, you know, for extraterrestrial life. The search for extrasolar planets also includes the study of planetary habitability, which considers a wide range of factors in determining an extrasolar planet's suitability for hosting life. So has anyone ever heard of something, a career called an exobiologist or exobiology? That's where people study potential biology on other planets. Absolutely fascinating. And you can be completely wrong and no one will ever know. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> well, maybe eventually they will. Okay, so okay. this is a, this is a, um, a slide that kind of shows the habitable zones. And it's that green area. And so, um, you know, like in our, in our um, solar system here, as you can see on the bottom, You've got the habitable zone starts at Venus and it goes slightly past Mars. Now, I would personally think that this is a pretty liberal interpretation of the habitable zone because usually um, moisture on Mars, it's frozen and then it sublimates. That means it goes directly from a solid to a gas. There's not really, um, I don't think they found any liquid water on Mars that I know of. So, like I said, I think this is a very liberal um, interpretation. I'm sorry? Oh. The reason that happens is actually because the lack of atmospheric pressure on Mars. Oh, that's right. That's right. Thank you, Heather. Yes. I, I'm, I'm glad that there's a physicist in the room. And if anybody else has anything else to, um, to add, please do. Um, you know, this is supposed to be an interactive thing, and we've got a lot of folks in this room that, that have a lot of um, collective knowledge. Okay? So what Heather's saying is that if there were an atmosphere on Mars, then we might have water. And because of the lack of atmosphere, that's why we don't really have liquid water there. So it is possible that at one time when, um, you know, they, they, with this, these recent missions to Mars, they are finding evidence of liquid water. Uh, I think I read an article today that talked about water, subterranean water on Mars. And so um, that would tend to mean that there must have been an atmosphere there at one point. Okay, so again, just very recently, a lot of these discoveries have been just in the last few weeks. Um, on January the 7th, astronomers from the Kepler mission announced the discovery of, again, a big, long name, KOI-172.02. This is an Earth-like exoplanet candidate orbiting a star similar to our Sun in the habitable zone and possibly a prime candidate to host alien life. So in this graphic here, um, the picture on the left is an artist's concept drawing of what this KOI-172.02 looks like, and then Earth is on the right. So. Other than the size comparison, I don't know how much credence I would place on, uh, you know, on this uh, drawing here, but it's just an artist um, you know, trying to be positive and think that you know, maybe there are continents and water and things like that on there. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Planets are really tiny and faint. Has anybody ever tried to look at planets through their telescope before? Not exoplanets, but just, you know solar system planets. Even Jupiter, as big as it is, requires a tremendous amount of magnification to really see much detail on it. It still looks very tiny. Um, I've looked at Jupiter, uh, you know, even at 300 power and still, you know, it, it's, not, it's not a lot to look at. So you can imagine that planets that are outside of our solar system would be very, very difficult to detect. At visible wavelengths, they usually have less than a millionth of their parent star's brightness. It is difficult to detect such a faint light source. And furthermore, the parent star causes a glare that tends to wash it out. So it's kind of like somebody shining a flashlight in your face and trying to see their face. It's really, really difficult, especially in a dark room. It's very difficult to do. So basically, um, it's necessary to block out the light from the parent star in order to reduce the glare while leaving the light in front of the planet detectable. Doing so is a major technical challenge. So what we've got here in the upper left-hand corner um, is a, I'm trying to think, I believe this is Kappa, Kappa Andromeda 
B. Um, it's that tiny little faint uh, round object in the upper left hand corner. You can see in the upper left hand picture there's a big gray circle and that's where they have tried to block out Kappa, Kappa Andromeda. And that's a star in the Andromeda constellation. In the lower right it's the same area but what they're trying to do here in this picture is they're trying to show you two things. Um, one is the size of Neptune's orbit and everybody knows Neptune is way 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 out there and this Kappa Andromeda B planet is even further out than that, so it's very, very far away. Also, even with the star mass, all of that purple and yellow and um, greenish blue light that you see is still residual light scattered from the starlight. So even with the star blocked out, we still have a tremendous amount of scattered light, so it is really difficult uh, to, to, to see these things. This is one of the few direct images that you will see um, uh, of, of exoplanets that are actually imaged. Most of them are discovered through a much more indirect method. So this is quite a treat to actually have a real photograph of one. This is another actual photograph though of uh, exoplanet. Um, this is around the star HR 8799 using a vortex coronagraph on a 1.5 meter portion of the Hale telescope. Uh, all exoplanets that have been directly imaged are both large, more massive than Jupiter, and widely separated from their parent star, just like you saw in this previous image. It's very, very far away. And this is with direct imaging. Most of them are also very hot, so they emit a lot of intense infrared radiation. Um, and these images have been made uh, at the infrared where the planet is brighter than its visible wavelength. So this is all, the reason it looks kind of fuzzy is this is, this is normal for an infrared photograph. Through direct, I'm sorry, though direct imaging may become more important in the future, the mass majority of known extrasolar planets have been detected through indirect methods. Now this image right here again is from uh, the uh, ESO image of a planet near Beta Pictoris. Uh, this is a composite image that represents the close environment of Beta Pictoris as seen in near infrared light. So um, you can again see that there's a lot of uh, really interesting things going on, but this is a very, uh, it's very rare to be able to get a direct image. So if we don't have, if we can't look through our telescope and see them directly, then how do we actually find these planets that are out there? So the following are indirect methods that have proven very useful in detecting exoplanets. So here's our detection methods. Radial velocity or Doppler method. There's also the transit method. There's the transit timing variation. There's something we talked about earlier called gravitational microlensing. Astrometry is the best way I know how to pronounce it. If anybody knows a better pronunciation, please let me know. But I believe that's pronounced astrometry or astrometry. We also have this really interesting thing called pulsar timing, and we have circumstellar disks, which are all very, very interesting. All right, I hope my animation's going to work here. Oh, good, it does. Okay. So I'm not great with PowerPoint, so I had to fight with a few things today. The first method that I mentioned is called radial velocity method, and you can tell from these, um, these animations here a little bit about what's going on. You see how those stars are wobbling? They're doing that because of the gravitational pull on those planets. And uh, if there are any physicists in the room that want to step in and give us any more information, please do. Um, a star with a planet will move on its own small orbit in response to the planet's gravity. This leads to variations in the speed with which a star moves towards or away from the Earth. I.e., the variations are in the radial velocity of the star with respect to the Earth. The radial velocity can be deduced from the displacement and the parent star spectral lines due to the Doppler effect. Has everybody heard of Doppler radar? Certainly you've heard of somebody honking their horn as they pass you and the, and the pitch changes. That's all the Doppler effect. The radial velocity method measures these variations in order to confirm the presence of the planet. So look at the animation in the lower right hand corner. Let's say that this, this star is between or uh, it's, it's within the line of sight of the Earth. So at times the star is moving towards the Earth, and at other times the star is moving away. And because of the Doppler effect, we should be able to see 
whether or not it's moving away or towards us. So the way that they use the Doppler effect in this instance, on this top part right here, I've got a continuous spectrum of light. This is just uh, white light run through a prism and it's broken up you know, into all the various colors of white light in the visible spectrum. The next image right below that shows absorption lines. When, um, when you look at starlight through a prism, you may notice that the whole spectrum is not there. There'll be black lines that will be present uh, in that spectrum of light. And those, those lines are very um, indicative of the types of uh, materials that are in those stars. In other words, it can tell us what those stars are made out of. And uh, scientists frequently use that a lot to determine um, what they call the metallicity of stars. And uh, that, that becomes very significant when people study stars. Well, these absorption lines actually shift left and right. These black lines that you see will shift left and right depending on whether the star is moving towards us or whether it's moving away from us. So it's really easy to tell. Um, a red shift in the spectral lines, just like you see here, right there below where it says red shift, you'll see the normal absorption lines of some star. As that star moves towards us, those absorption lines actually shift to the right. So we know that star is moving away from us. I believe I got that right, because I always get this backwards. Um, if those spectral lines had shifted to the left, I'm sorry, shifted um, to the blue end of the spectrum, which in this case would be to the left, that means the object would be moving towards us. So you should theoretically be able to look at a star um, and tell whether these absorption lines have shifted to the right or to the left, and I believe you have to monitor them over time and see where they shift before you would know. But uh, this is the main principle that allows um, astronomers to determine whether or not a, a, a star is moving towards or away from us. So in this previous, actually I think I've got a better one, here we go. So as this is, uh, as these stars are rotating around, when they are getting closer to us you can see the little squiggly blue lines, and then when it's moving away you can see the little squiggly red line. And hopefully that'll help to, um, you know, explain this a little bit better. Okay. The next indirect method that is used to detect exoplanets is called the transit method. Now I personally think this is kind of exciting because a lot of amateur astronomers are now doing this from their light polluted uh, backyards or from their light polluted front yards with very simple equipment. Um, I've seen uh, a number of our members have been able to do this. And uh, I've had, is, is uh, George, uh, doesn't he do that? Yeah. George uh, Hall. George yeah. Hall is a, is a TAS member that has um, done some really fantastic work uh, with imaging. He actually recorded an impact of an object on Jupiter last year that just went viral. I mean, it was uh, all, over, all over the world. People were looking at this. But um, I have seen uh, George present graphs very similar to the one below. And basically, this has to do with a chance alignment of a planet going right between us and a star. Now if those planets were to orbit differently and didn't go between the Earth and that star, we'd never see them. But um, this, is, uh, this is what we call a transit method. This is when, uh, did, did anybody happen to see the Venus transit uh, this past June? Yes, that was very exciting. Um, if you missed it, I'm sorry, you'll never get to see it again in your lifetime. <laughs> Because it won't come back for a very long time. <coughs> um, that is a transit. Uh, later, much, much later this year, we're going to have a shadow transit on Jupiter where three, the, the shadow of three of Jupiter's moons will be clearly visible. And I plan to be out there with all my imaging equipment. And i got to capture that because that will be great. Well, in this instance, as you see from the top picture, we have a planet that goes in front of the star. And um, when that happens, just like whenever you put anything in front of a light, it gets dim. And so the amount by which the star dims depends on its size and on the size of the planet, among other factors. This has been the second most productive method of detection, though it suffers from a substantial rate of false positives and confirmation from another method is usually necessary. So that means that a lot of times people get really excited and they think they found an exoplanet because of this graph that they've gotten. But when they use some of these other methods, they find that, no, I'm sorry, that's actually a false positive. The transit method reveals the radius of the planet and it has the benefit that it sometimes allows a planet's atmosphere to be investigated through spectroscopy. So remember in this earlier slide here, 
when I showed you about these absorption lines, they also have something that's the inverse of this called emission lines. And they use all of those together uh, to determine using light what something is made out of. So what happens is, is as the uh, light from the star passes through the atmosphere of a planet, uh, we may be able to look at that, that spectra of light and determine what's in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, which is kind of exciting. That also helps them to determine uh, whether it might have uh, life or, or potential for life. Let's see if there's anything else I had here. Okay. By the way, the bottom image is from the Kepler 6b photometry. So this is, this is an actual graph uh, from the Kepler mission of the uh, Kepler 6b exoplanet. There's a variation on this method, and I'm going to play this animation while I read this next bit. And cross your fingers and let's hope this actually works. So if a planet has been detected by the transit method, then variation in the timing of the transit proves an extremely sensitive method which is capable of detecting additional planets in the system with sizes potentially as small as Earth-sized planets. It's not playing, is it? <coughs> there we go. All right. Perfect. So just watch this while I, while I um, finish my comments on this. The first significant detection of a non-transiting planet using tran time, transit timing variation was carried out with NASA's Kepler satellite. The transiting planet, Kepler 19b, shows TTV, or transit time variation method, with an amplitude of five minutes and a period of about 300 days, indicating the presence of a second planet, Kepler 19c. Now remember earlier when I, when I talked about the way that they named these planets, Kepler-19 would be uh, potentially a star. B would be the first planet uh, around that star, so C would be the second planet. The planets do not start numbering with A. They start numbering with B. Um, and this Kepler-19C has a period which is, near, which is a near rational multiple of the period of the transiting planet. So timing variation asks whether the transit occurs with strict periodicity or if there's a variation. Transit, oh, I'm sorry, so this is the uh, transit duration variation method. And transit variation asks how long the transit takes. Duration variation may be caused by an exomoon. For some reason, my wife just loved thinking about exomoons, moons on other, you know, in other solar systems. I think that's pretty cool, too. So does everybody understand what this is saying? Basically, what they're saying is that if we had one planet orbiting a star, it would be incredibly regular. It should just orbit it with a... Um, they should be able to time it, and every time that planet goes around that star, it should be the exact same time, but not always. And if there's a variation, if, if the transit time <laughs> varies every so often, then they say, well, why? There must be something of mass, something that's, that's very heavy, like another planet, that's interfering with that first planet and causing it to vary slightly. So just by simply timing, so when we looked at these graphs earlier, where we were, let me back up here, if you were to time, when you, when you see that dip in the graph, that means that the light got dim. And if we were to take a stopwatch and time that, if there was a variation in that, then there's very likely a second planet in the solar system. So a lot of these are, again, you know, it's not a direct observation, it's an indirect method of how to detect these things. All right, I'm kind of moving fast here. Does anybody have any questions so far? Because if you do, Joe's got all the answers. <laughs> 42, all right. All right, so now we're going to talk about something that I think is really interesting. Um, it applies to more than just exoplanets, but uh, this is called gravitational microlensing. This occurs when a gravitational field of a star acts like a lens, magnifying the light of a distant background star. The effect occurs only when the two stars are almost exactly aligned with each other. Lensing effects are brief lasting for weeks or days, as the two stars and Earth are all moving relative to each other. More than a thousand such events have been observed over the past 10 years. If the foreground lensing star has a planet, like you see there in the middle of this, then the planet's own gravitational field can make a detectable contribution to the lensing effect. So does everybody understand what that's saying? So they're saying that 
the planet actually adds to the lensing effect that that lens star there in the middle creates. Since that requires a highly improbable alignment, a very large number of distant stars must be continually monitored in order to detect planetary microlensing contributions at a reasonable rate. In other words, this is really hard. I mean, this doesn't happen very often. This method is most fruitful for planets between Earth and the center of the galaxy if the galactic center provides a large number of background stars. So does everybody kind of understand what this is saying? So basically, we've got our observer here on the left. They're on the Earth, or it's the Kepler spacecraft. And then we've got these two stars that have a chance alignment with the Earth. And when that planet is orbiting around that star, it actually magnifies the lensing effect. So that distant star would be seen differently if the star in the middle were not there. The star in the middle actually magnifies that star. And so if there's a planet there that adds to that magnification or that lensing effect, then we can indirectly detect the existence of that planet. Okay, and this is the word that I have trouble pronouncing again, astrometry. This consists of precisely measuring a star's motion in the sky and observing the changes in that position over time. So this is really tedious. I mean, this can take a very, very long time of somebody watching the same planet, which is very resource intensive. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever talked to anyone that does scientific research, but uh, people fight, kill, steal their way <laughs> into getting time on equipment and telescopes and resources, and with the economy being bad, it's even harder and harder. So you can appreciate that something like this is, is very difficult to do. The motion of a star due to the gravitational influence of a planet may be observable. Because the motion is so small, however, this method has not yet been very productive. It has produced only a few disputed detections, though it has been successfully used to investigate the properties of planets found in other ways. So has anybody ever taken just, when you're a kid, taken a rock on a string and swung it around? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is basically what's going on here. You can't swing that rock around or whatever object you've got on a string if your hand is completely motionless. You've got to have a little bit of a counterweight here. And in this particular um, diagram, that, that X is kind of the center of gravity between those two objects. And so um, our own sun does this. Uh, it does wobble. Um, and a lot of this stuff that we're talking about here is just a fancy way of saying they watched the way these stars wobbled and they could infer whether or not there was the presence of a large body. Sometimes it's another star, sometimes it's a planet. Um, but uh, in this case, they're just, they're actually plotting uh, these stars and the motion over time, and if they notice that these stars move in the way that they move, uh, they may uh, deduce or infer or whatever that there is actually a planet or other body. All right, now we're gonna have to cross our fingers again because here I tried to get fancy with it with an anim animation, and um, I'm hoping that it's gonna work. Okay, great. This is another method of detection, which is interesting to me. It's called pulsar timing. Now, in this animation that I've got here, um, it's not entirely apropos for what we're talking about, but it sort of works. Um, a pulsar, uh, as you can see there, it's spinning, and that other object in this is a, is a star, but it very well could be a planet. And so, um, let's see if I can get it going again. There we go, okay. So what is a pulsar? Well, a pulsar is a neutron star the small, ultra-dense remnant of a star that has exploded as a supernova. Pulsars emit radio waves extremely regularly as they rotate. This is significant. Because the intrinsic rotation of a pulsar is so regular, <coughs> slight anomalies in the timing of its observed radio pulses can be used to track the pulsar's motion. Like an ordinary star, a pulsar will move in its own small orbit if it has a planet. Calculations based on pulse timing observations can then reveal the parameters of that orbit. So as this thing orbits around, if there's a planet interfering, then it's very easy to detect using radio uh, astronomy. I say easy. Uh, it, it's, it's possible. <laughs> I shouldn't say easy. This method was not originally designed for the detection of planets, but it is so sensitive that it is capable of detecting planets Small, I'm sorry, far smaller than any other method can, down to less than a tenth of the Earth's mass. So it's very sensitive. It's also capable of detecting mutual gravitational perturbations between the various members of a planetary system, therefore revealing further information about those planets and other orbital parameters. 
So does everybody understand that you've got this spinning pulsar that's emitting very regular, very regularly timed radio, I guess you could say broadcast. Uh, Joe has actually um, been able to provide us with um, audio of these before. And would you say it sounded like a lawnmower engine going? Yeah. Some of them spin Machine really... Machine gun. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, this is something that you can, uh, you can actually tune into on the earth if you have the right equipment. Uh, you can listen to these things and um, the variation and their timing uh, can indicate that there is actually uh, a, a large body around this. And um, because it is so precise with the timing of, of these pulsars and their um, emissions, uh, it's very sensitive and uh, it's a great way for them to, to detect things. Um, the sad thing about it is, as accurate as it is, um, the pulsar timing method, uh, this is very rare. Uh, the main drawback to the pulsar timing method is that pulsars are relatively rare. So it is unlikely that a large number of planets will be found this way. Also, life as we know it could not survive on planets orbiting the pulsar since high energy radiation there is extremely intense. Uh, let's see, I've got a note here that says in 1992, and I'm going to get his name wrong, Alexander Wolfson and Dale Frail used this method to discover planets around the pulsar PSR 1257 plus 12. Their discovery was quickly confirmed, making it the first confirmation of planets outside our solar system. I mentioned this earlier, and I do believe that that is the very first extrasolar or exoplanet that was ever discovered. But again, it wasn't around a, it wasn't around a, um, a main sequence star like ours. Now, my animation made it to where I couldn't go to the next slide, so I'm going to have to do a little unconventional bit here. Okay, so the last thing I believe that we're going to talk about um, is when it comes to detection methods, is circumstellar disks. Now these are disks of space dust around many stars believed to originate from collisions among asteroids and comets. So we're talking about something pretty cataclysmic. The dust can be detected because it absorbs starlight, absorbs starlight and re-emits it as infrared radiation. Features in the disk may suggest the presence of planets, though this is not considered a definitive detection method. The Hubble Space Telescope is capable of observing disks dust with its NICMOS near infrared camera and multi object spectrometer instrument. Even better images have now been taken by its sister instrument, the Spitzer Space Telescope, and by the European Space Agency's Herschel Space Observatory, which can now see far deeper into infrared wavelengths than the Hubble Cam. Dust disks have now been found around more than 15% of nearby Sun like stars. And this is a artist conception of two Pluto-sized dwarf planets in a collision around Vega. So it's pretty, uh, pretty cataclysmic. Okay, so most, I know, isn't that sexy? <laughs> most confirmed extrasolar <laughs> planets have been found using ground-based telescopes, like this one right here. Again, this is, an, I love the VLT. It's, an, it's another picture of the VLT. Um, However, many of the methods can work more effectively with space-based telescopes that avoid atmospheric haze and turbulence. COROT launched December of 2006, and Kepler, which was launched, everybody's heard of Kepler, launched in March 2009, are two currently active space missions dedicated to searching for extra, extrasolar planets. So Hubble is one of those that gets used for a lot of different things. People fight for time on it to do various types of research, but the Kepler is one of the really important ones that are specifically dedicated to uh, looking for um, exoplanets. The Hubble Space Telescope and most have also found or confirmed a few planets. And I'm going to get this name wrong again, but it's Gia? G-I-G-A-I-A? -I -A? Does anybody know how to pronounce that? G-I-A? <laughs> I don't know. G-A-A? Gaia? 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 Is that how you say it? Okay, Gaia. I'm horrible at pronunciation. This is going to be launched in March 2013. So it's very soon. Uh, this should be March. And this is going to use astrometry to determine the true masses of 1,000 nearby exoplanets. So this image that you're looking at right here, this shows the interior of one of the four 8.2 meter unit telescopes at ESO's Very Large Telescope in Paranal, Chile. This is designated Unit Telescope 1 or UT1 and named ANTU. This complex Science Machine has been in operation in Paraná since 1999. So this particular telescope is really cool. There's this one of four. 
and they use all four of them at once. Um, and I believe that it said that the distance between all four of them is like having just one big mirror that size. And is that in, in for, how do you say that? They do the same thing? Interferometry. Interferometry, thank you. Another word I can't pronounce. Um, they do a lot of this uh, with uh, radio telescopes as well. And there's the, um, the VLA, is that right? The very large array? VLA and also Keck. Uh, and Keck. Hawaii. They use right. similar techniques, but only with, um, <laughs> only with radio telescopes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Chile, you got to go to this thing. This is really awesome. All right, so it wouldn't be proper to talk about exoplanets without giving just a few minutes to the uh, Kepler mission. This is an artist drawing of the Kepler spacecraft. Um, this is a, for those of you that haven't heard of Kepler, this is a space observatory launched by NASA. And its primary mission is to discover Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. The spacecraft was named in honor of the 17th century German astronomer Johannes Kepler, who was launched on March 7th of <coughs> 2009. It's been active for three years, 10 months, and 23 days as of January 30th. So that was two days ago. So actually, I guess we should say 25 days now that it's been a 10 years, 10, let's see, what is this? Three years, 10 months, and 25 days. So it's been up there for a while, and it's been, um, it's been doing a lot of, a lot of work. The Kepler's observatory is specifically designed to survey a portion of our region of the Milky Way galaxy to discover dozens of Earth-sized planets in or near the habitable zone and determine how many of the billions of stars in our galaxies have such planets. So you can see here where our sun is, near the center, and this is showing the area of the Milky Way galaxy that Kepler is focusing on. In the Kepler spacecraft, it's really cool, it has a photometer that continually monitors the brightness of over 145,000 main sequence stars in a fixed field of view. So it's constantly monitoring 145,000 stars. The data is transmitted to Earth, then analyzed to detect periodic dimming caused by extrasolar planets that cross in front of their host star. As of January 2013, in other words, just last month, there are a total of 2,740 candidates. In January 2013, astronomers at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, or CFA, used Kepler's data to, to estimate that at least 17 billion Earth-sized planets reside in the Milky Way galaxy. So that means that in our own galaxy, they think that there's at least 17 billion planets about our size, which is very interesting, very cool. So we're not as... Uh, we may not be as unique as we thought. The Kepler is part of NASA's discovery program of relatively low cost, focused primary science missions. The telescope's construction and initial operation were managed by NASA's JPL with Ball Aerospace responsible for developing the Kepler flight system. The, and I'm gonna say this wrong, is it Ames, AMES Research Center is responsible for the ground system development mission operation since 2009 and science data analysis. The uh, mission originally was supposed to go for three and a half years, uh, but last year uh, it was extended uh, to 2016 because of difficulties in processing and analyzing the huge volumes of data collected by the spacecraft. So uh, there were a few things that, that were a little crazy. Okay, so that's all I've got to say about Kepler. Um, there is tons more data out there on the web if you'd like to look up uh, information about Kepler. It's a really exciting mission. There, are, um, It changes all the time. There's probably an iPhone app. I'm sure there's got to be an iPhone app for exoplanet discovery. Oh, yeah, there is. Oh, there is. Okay. Okay, cool. Great, great. So, uh, you know, while you're sitting there at work or at school, you can get a little beep on your phone and it'll tell you, hey, you know, we found another one, there's, we found another one you know. And so, uh, they're always, um, this is bleeding edge. Um, you know, astronomy right here. So it's, it's very exciting. And again, it's something, you know, that I didn't grow up with. Earlier, we talked about the habitable zone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, in astronomy and astrobiology, when we talked about that earlier, the habitable zone, or more accurately, the circumstellar habitable zone, or CHZ for short, is the scientific term for the region around a star within which it is theoretically possible for a planet with sufficient atmosphere, thank you Heather, pressure to maintain liquid water on its surface. I knew we'd get there sooner or later. I knew that was in there somewhere. So the significance of the concept is in the inference of conditions favorable for life on Earth. 
Since liquid water is essential for all known forms of life, planets in this zone are considered the most promising sites to host extraterrestrial life. The term ecosphere and liquid water belt were introduced by Hubertus Stronghold and Harlow Shapley, respectively, in 1953. And apologies to both of those men for mispronouncing their names. Contemporary alternatives include HZ, Life Zone, and Goldilocks Zone. Everybody's heard of the Goldilocks planet that was discovered a while back. What? Yeah. Habitable zone is sometimes used more gener generally to denote various regions that are considered favorable to life in some way. One prominent example is the galactic habitable zone, coined by Guillermo Gonzalez in 1995, representing the distance of a planet from the galactic center based on the position of the Earth in the Milky Way. If different kinds of habitable zones are considered, their intersection in the region considered most likely to contain life. Oh, I'm sorry, their intersection is the region considered most likely to contain life. All right, so that's all I have to say. Does anybody else have anything they would like to add or questions that Joe can answer for you? Can <laughs> 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 I bore everybody to death? Come on in, come on in. This is kind of a dumb question I'm asking, but, um, yeah, but yeah. when you're talking about dimming, how do they know that it's not an, how do they know it's an exoplanet and not like an asteroid or some other type of body? Well, they don't. They actually don't. And that's why confirmation is so critical. And when they're doing the confirmation, is there a specific method they use to confirm, or does it depend on the initial method that they use? Multiple methods. Yeah, go ahead. Eric's got some information on that. Do they have to confirm by at least two different methods for it to be considered confirmed? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, they do. Yeah, usually what happens is... Uh, Somebody will, will perform some sort of research and they'll say, hey, I think I found something. And then a whole bunch of other scientists will rush out and try to tell them why they're wrong. Is <laughs> so. there like a standard of confirmation as far as methodology goes? There is. No, there's, there's no? Okay, I thought that in the, when, when the guy came and talked to us about the Kepler mission, he mentioned that there was... I thought he did, too. But Heather's got some information. There's some that are considered better than others, but as far as confirmation, the gold standard, not really. Right. Oh. Right. There is no single. Right. But I, I believe that there are, it, there are certain parameters. If if you've used two or more methods, then I think that there are certain generally accepted uh, thoughts that yes, there is. Uh, we're we're 99.98% sure that there really is an exoplanet out there, which is I mean that's that's pretty good confirmation. But yeah, like Heather said, I don't think there's anything. Eric, did you have something to add? Uh, just a new thing that's come out within the last few weeks. They've actually shrank the habitable zone. Oh, really? Yeah. Ah, they've, they've shrunk just, it, huh? Just inside of Earth's orbit and just barely outside of Mars' orbit. Mars is actually on the edge. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, so Mars is... So I was right earlier when I said... I was right for the wrong reason. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Because if Mars had an atmosphere, then they could have liquid water. I but Mars does have an atmosphere. That's sure. true. It is very, very thin, the though. Pressure, yeah, I, the pressure is equivalent to about 100,000 feet Earth. Is it okay? It, 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 yeah, it, it, I don't think you could fly a plane on Mars. N not a not a propeller plane. You mean that movie with that guy and that monkey and stuff? That he was walking around there. He couldn't do that, right? Uh, well, I wasn't alive when that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Joe is a connoisseur of fine uh, science fiction, science fiction uh, Very fine science from fiction. the uh, early days of uh, film. Robinson Crusoe on Mars. There you go. There you go. Robinson Crusoe on Mars. Okay, so here's what I want you to walk away with. I mean, I know I gave a lot of information, um, but number one, just understand that there are planets outside of this solar system. Sadly, as you saw, it's very difficult to photograph them. So very few of them. There, there, there's a list. Actually, if you go on, on Wikipedia, there is a list of planets, uh, exoplanets that have been found using the direct observation method. Um, you know, for people actually photo. It's a very short list. So uh, the vast majority of these 800 and some odd planets that they have confirmed that exist, uh, very few of them have actually been photographed. So we rely on all of these indirect methods of science. Uh, to find them, but most of it has to do with the way that that planet gravitationally interacts or uh, photonically, I guess you could say, the way that it dims the star in front of it. So, like you said, it's not enough. 
if 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 the star. Um, in fact, I think in the presentation here, I talked about how um, when that that actually that detection method gives a lot of false positives because a lot of times it is something else. So there is a another region another reason why that star dims. And so when they go to look at these other um, things like I don't know Doppler shifts, um, whatever other methods that they use, they say no, I'm sorry, there's not, you know, there's not a planet there. But I guess would regularity be one of the things that they would Oh, yeah. Right? oh yeah. Yes, yeah. regularity. Yeah. That's right. Remember that it's a planet orbiting a star, so <laughs> you could be sitting there waiting for a year or more for it to come around again. Well, yeah. Then you think how how frequently Jupiter orbits the sun in our Earth years. It doesn't go very fast. I mean, it, it, it would take somebody, I don't remember what the, I don't remember what the Jupiter's period is. 12, I believe. Is it 12 years? Okay. So yeah, so somebody else in another solar system trying to find Jupiter, number one, there'd have to be a chance alignment where Jupiter went in front of us, if you were using that method. And then uh, they'd have to sit there and stare at our sun for 12, 13 years, and actually they'd have to do it for even longer to confirm that it came back around again. So, you know, you could actually spend a lifetime just looking for one Jupiter, you know, and confirming that it exists. So, um, so yeah. So get the flu on your own now, it's too bad. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> get the flu on your own. Or get the clouds, you know. <laughs> well, that's why that they recommend, um, you know, uh, space-based telescopes to get rid of things like clouds and turbulence yeah. and interference. Yeah. But I, I do believe that, uh, like they said, um, you know, most of most of the discoveries have been from ground-based telescopes. Yeah, you have to think also is most of the discoveries from ground-based telescopes have been hot Jupiters, mm -hmm. which yeah. are flying around their suns within three, four, five, six days. Yeah, yeah. right. Like clockwork. Oh, the the other thing that you should take away, and I can't believe I didn't mention this in my presentation, and this is very significant scientifically. Um, this has kind of blown apart all the classic theories on solar system creation. When they first started detecting some of these hot Jupiters, the, the, the astrophysicists were saying, well, wait a minute, that's not supposed to be possible. Uh, that shouldn't be there. So either, well, we're wrong, I guess. <laughs> and so um, it's really starting to, to cause a lot of folks in the scientific community to have to really rethink a lot of their uh, theories about solar system evolution and, and how planets are formed and things like that. And this has only happened, uh, you know, in the last uh, couple of decades. This is relatively new. This isn't something that you know we've known about for long periods of time, and this is a, this is a new science. So if you if you want to have no life and make no money, and you're excited about science, then go and do this because uh, it's an exciting new new way. All right, Z, we got anything else? Okay. Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, close up here, and uh, we're going to set up some telescopes very near here. Uh, there's a small grassy area as you exit the building, kind of off to your left there. Um, we're going to set up some telescopes and going to hang out for an hour or so. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. So, yeah, please stick around. I didn't bring the big ticket.